Oh, I was really hoping there'd be a little more light. I really was. <laughs> it is great to be here, and um, it's an honor, actually, uh, for me to have the pulpit of Rick Webb for a day. Um, let me just send you greetings from everyone worshiping, lifting high the Lord as well, just down the street at Mosaic. Uh, my wife uh, is there this morning, but I want to bring you greetings from my wife and my 14-year-old who's still with us. We've emancipated three and still got one at home, um, and they are worshiping this morning at Mosaic. Uh, they had their op- obligations there this morning. Dana did, so that's why she's not here. Let, let me just tell you that I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because of the way you take care of Rick and Lynn. I mean, letting them get away for a weekend is just an awesome, you have no idea, that is water on parched ground for a pastor. So thank you for doing that, letting them do that. That is a a very important um, ministry into your pastor and pastor's wife life, okay? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your grace, which is so evident Uh, in our midst this morning. Thank you that you are a good shepherd, that you never, ever abuse us. You call us. You you encourage us. And as we've been reminded, you pursue us, Lord. When we pray, you lean over to hear what we will say to you, just to acknowledge your care and love for us. And today, Lord, as I come, I come with what you've put on my heart for your people, heart's journey. And Lord, I pray it would be received with grace. It would be received with love and with the power of the Spirit at work in every individual's life today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, you should have got one of these when you came in. Did you get one of these? I hope if you don't, uh, raise your hand now. We'll make sure you've got one. So, guys, if you could just make sure that everyone that's got a hand in the air gets one of these, that'd be great. We're, we're going to stop down in a little bit and work through this together. And what it's going to do is help us just kind of personally, transparently, yet anonymously go before the Lord and see where we are today. Okay, One of my roles at Mosaic, I'm the pastor of equipping and connection. So my job at Mosaic is to help people get into relational connection. So if you ever thought there'd be someone that did that, I do that. And so at Mosaic, I do that. And then the other thing I do is called equipping. And that is basically making disciples. So today what we're going to talk about is discipleship optimism. Do people know we're following Jesus? Okay. Now when I was called to the middle, a little bit on me, uh, born in East Tennessee, loved radio, got involved in radio, and began what I call the U.S. leg of a world tour in radio. If you're in radio, basically you can throw a dart at a map anywhere in the U.S., you can probably get a job, or at least it used to be that way. And so I traveled from East Tennessee to South Carolina to Denver, Colorado to Lincoln, but uh, Nebraska, go Cornhuskers. But when I was in Denver, Christ got a hold of my heart. I don't know if it's because it's a mile closer or what, to heaven? I don't know. But it was there that I surrendered my heart and will to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we began to, he began to reprioritize our life as he does. We ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and there was where he called my wife and I to full-time ministry. And we ended up being missionaries to marriage, which brought us to Little Rock, Arkansas. We were with an organization called Family Life. You may have heard of Family Life, Dennis Rainey's ministry out in the ranch. And uh, we were there for 11 years, and I worked in their media area, video and audio. And then six years ago, God called me to the pastorate at Mosaic. And so there now, I am doing, uh, helping people come into the church, get connected in the church, and then helping them to be discipled. And one of the things that I learned, though, while I was in radio, because I was in radio on the air, then in management and in sales, and primarily in sales, is optimism. You guys, are you guys optimists? Are, Are you naturally optimistic? Okay, good. Good. I am as well. Now, there are some things that will rob that from you, right? 
<laughs> you know, like hanging with a pessimist can be kind of hard. But if you are an optimist, you, you generally just have this fresh, positive outlook on life. Now, the definition of optimism is, it's from the Latin word optimus. It means best. Did you know that? Which describes how an optimistic person is always looking for the best in any situation. It's the silver lining. You know, I'll find it. It's the bright side. It's the sunny side of the street that we'll walk on. You know, if anything bad happens, it's kind of that Romans, R- Romans idea of God's got this. All things work together for the good of those. Now that's faith, not optimism. There is a difference. But it's still like when a loss of a job comes, the loss of a relationship, a relationship, loss of a loved one, an optimist tends to say, okay, God's got this, we'll, we'll keep moving, right? But after I, I think about my walk with Christ, and I think there's a picture up there. You guys have seen this picture. Sometimes optimism gets in the way of our discipleship. And the first time I saw that picture, I kind of laughed at it. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, that I don't think is who Jesus is. Come on now. I don't see Jesus that way. In fact, Scripture would say a little differently. Optimists have a problem, though. I have a problem as an optimist. I, over, I overthink the bright side and forget about the cost side. You ever been there? It's like we just think it's all going to be okay, and yet we forget that there might be you know, a, 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 an underestimation taking place on the cost. Example, my wife and I last spring said we're going to have a garage sale, all right? Today is November 2nd. We have not yet had it. <laughs> yeah, you know why we haven't had it? Because we were thinking about, oh, we're going to, take, we're going to, we're going to just clear out all the stuff, you know. We're, we're, we're getting soon to be empty nesters, and we just don't need all this stuff. We just need to get it out. We're going to sell it, give it to the needy, give it to the church. We're, going to, we're just going to do this. But what we totally underestimated was how much time it's going to take to do it. I mean, you've got to get it out and price it, and then you've got to get tables and put, I mean, we just haven't had time to do it. It's been a busy year. Have you ever done anything like that? You're like, I'm going to accomplish this because of all the good, and you just underestimated the cost. Building a house can do that. If you've ever built a house, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? But see, this can happen with far more important things in our life, and that's why I think God has me here in front of you today. Here's the big idea of my time with you today. Optimism can be a problem when it comes to discipleship. We urge people to come to Christ, to be set free from their sin, to to lay down the guilt and shame of a life that's basically wrecked. And God will brace you up and bring everything and He will make all things new. And we just insinuate the incredible, the immeasurable, the immense benefits and blessings of being a follower of Jesus. And we put the rest of it in kind of fine print on the back page. Peter once asked Jesus in Matthew 19, verse 27, he said, we've left everything and followed you, Jesus. What then will we have? We might paraphrase it to say, you know, we've given up a lot to be here. And most of it we don't need or didn't really want, but we've given up a lot to follow you. Is it really worth it? Is how I'd paraphrase Jesus or Peter's question. Well, is it worth it to be a disciple of Jesus? I ask you. Well, let's look at some of the here and now benefits of discipleship. All right? The here and now benefits of discipleship. I love these. How about this? An awareness of God's immeasurable love for us. You can't measure it. It's immeasurable. There's this beautiful hymn. If the oceans with ink were filled, and every stalk a pen, you could not write the love of God. If all the sky were parchment, it wouldn't fit. It's beautiful. Look at John 3, 16 and 17. You know this. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And in Romans 5.8, I was with a man last week who told me this was the pivotal point in his exit, I cannot say this word, existential, thank you, it's that, it's, you know what I'm talking about, it's that life philosophy. He said when he hit Romans 5.8 in the context of reading the whole of Romans, God crushed him with, but while he was still a sinner. God showed his love for us through Christ. The awareness of God's immeasurable love, that's a benefit. 
of God's of, of our discipleship. Another one is forgiveness of our sin. We just sang about this. I'm free. I'm set free from the chains. The guilt that I carried, he took it. The shame that I carried, I don't have to live like that anymore. Amen? The forgiveness of our sin, a here and now benefit. Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without what? Without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Then Romans 8, 1 and 2, my favorite verse in the whole of Romans. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And in John 8, 36, Jesus' own words, If the Son sets you free, you shall be free, what? Indeed. Exactly. A here and now benefit is the forgiveness of our sin. Another one is the peace of God which informs our life and grounds our soul. His peace poured out in you that he's got this. He's got you, right? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but by everything, by prayer, supplication, let your thanksgiving be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then the peace that if God be for us, who can be against us, right? Does that give your soul peace and grounding today? That's a benefit of our discipleship, our following of Christ. Another one, the joy of God, the joy we get from Him, it's beyond our ability to really verbalize. 1 Peter 1.8, though you've not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And in James 1, 2, and 4, in the midst of the mess, count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, For you know that the testing of your faith produces a steadfastness. And let that steadfastness have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That brings us joy that God's got this. I love J.I. Packer. And from his book, Knowing God, he writes this. Not only will being a disciple bring a man forgiveness of sins, peace of conscience, and fellowship with God as his Abba Father... It will also mean that through the power of the indwelling Spirit, he will be able to overcome the sins that previously mastered him. And the light and leading that God will give him will enable him to find a way through problems of guidance, self-fulfillment, personal relations, heart's desire, and such like which had hitherto defeated him completely. Now, put like that in general terms, these great assurances are scriptural and true, and praise God, they are. Right, Hearts Journey? They are true today. Now, not only do we have the here and now benefits, we get these eternal benefits of being a disciple, right? Eternal. The eternal payoff is that we're going to be with God forever. Now, I was asked one day by one of my kids, Dad, what is it like to live in Africa? And I said, I have no idea. I've never been there, right? So in that context, that's what the Holy Spirit was trying to do in the biblical writers when they were trying to explain heaven. Never been there. How are you going to put this in words that we can get and comprehend the beauty, the joy? But one of the eternal benefits of our discipleship is that Jesus secured it for us. Amen? It's done. John 11, 25, 26, Jesus is in this conversation with Mary after Lazarus had died. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Our eternity in heaven is going to be one of the most unbelievable experiences we could ever imagine. It's better than the most beautiful paintings. I love the prodigal painting that was up there this morning. It's better than that. It's, it's better than the most delicious food. It's, it's better than the most exciting sport. It's better than the best relationship you've ever had, the f- best feelings you've ever had. It's better than anything on earth. It's going to be a tremendous reward. Rewards will be like a treasure. 
to us. And that's what Jesus spent his time using parables, and you know these parables. You know, Jesus shared many parables about our heavenly home and the parable of the virgins in Matthew 25. The reward that we'll get in heaven is like a marriage banquet. Remember that? You ever been to a bad marriage banquet? I mean, they're all pretty good. They're free for one, usually, unless you're paying for it, right? But they're free. In the parable of the talents later in Matthew 25, Jesus said that the reward is like being put in charge of many things and being able to share in the master's happiness. In the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, the disciples inherit a kingdom. We will inherit a kingdom in heaven. And in Luke 12, Jesus says that the faithful servant in heaven will be put in charge of the master's possessions. So we're going to have purpose in heaven, a joyful purpose in heaven. Jesus promised the 12 disciples in Matthew 19 that they will be rulers over the tribes of Israel. In Thyatira, members of the church in Revelation 2 are promised authority over the nations. So we're going to have some great things to do in heaven while we're enjoying the most incredible, unimaginable beauty in the presence of God himself. Jesus advised the disciples to store up for themselves treasures in heaven. So how do we store them up, you ask? By all of these examples and these parables, Jesus implies that what we do in this life is going to be rewarded in the next, right? The problem is we just don't have that vocabulary. That was Daniel's problem, Ezekiel's problem, John's problem. Something we've never experienced. How do you communicate with humans what that's like? Trying to use words based on our physical experience to describe something immensely spiritual, it's just hard. But the thing that is true is that our eternal benefits of being a disciple will be like treasure. It's like inheriting a kingdom. In some way, it's like being given the master's possessions. It will be similar to having a vineyard to take care of on behalf of the master. It'll be like having responsibility over cities, like a wedding banquet. We share in our master's happiness. It's like all these things and much more. Everybody's going to be fully happy. Everybody says, no dissatisfaction. Won't that be awesome? There'll be no dissatisfaction, no grumbling in heaven. No one will even think of a tiny way in which things could be better. We will have reached the purpose that God intended us for in eternity. I love that. And in the words of 1 Peter 1, and I think I've got these for your screen. Here's the words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Now, though for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I don't know about you, but when I talk about all these benefits of being a disciple, my optimism builds. I get excited about it. My heart warms and my faith grows. Does yours? I'm caught with a reality that I just can't even ignore even when my optimism tries to convince me otherwise. There is a cost to this discipleship. There's a cost to the discipleship. Let me continue with what J.I. Packer was, was writing. This is where that left off. But it is possible so to stress them and so to play down the rougher side of the Christian life The daily chastening, the endless way with sin and Satan, the periodic walk in darkness is to give the impression that normal Christian living is a perfect bed of roses, a state of affairs in which everything in the garden is lovely all the time and problems no longer exist. Or if they come, they have only to be taken to the throne of grace and they will melt away at once. This is to suggest that the world, the flesh, and the devil will give a man no serious trouble once he's a Christian, nor will his circumstances and personal relationships ever be a problem to him, nor will he ever be a problem to himself. Such such suggestions are mischievous, however, because they're simply false. 
repeatedly in the Word of God. I find Jesus cooling the enthusiasm of the disciples by urging them to consider the cost of discipleship. In evangelism circles today in the church, and I'm, I visit with a lot of pastors, and I'm in several churches, there seems to be a trend in the opposite direction. We urge people to be saved, to become disciples of the Lord Jesus, highlighting all the benefits and blessings, and we end up concealing the true cost of discipleship. We keep all the liabilities in the fine print, we mention, if we mention them at all. And I think what happens is our new disciples, our new believers, when they start experiencing life like that, they feel like they've been the subject of this huge bait-and-switch deal. You know what I mean? So if we desire to be followers of Jesus along the path of discipleship, it's very important that we listen and heed the words of Christ and count that cost, right? We need to count the cost. It's only when we do this that we can make an intelligent decision and be decisive in the matter of discipleship. Otherwise, we get blinded in the lukewarm glow of Christian enthusiasm. So what are the costs? What are the requirements of following Jesus? The Gospel of Luke chapter 14 Verses 25 through 33. Jesus outlined the requirements pretty clearly. I've got that. I think it's on the screen. Luke 14, 25. Now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does, not, who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's strong medicine. I've always heard that text presented in a financial stewardship context, haven't you? Rarely have I heard as Jesus intended. It's, you need to count the cost of this before you take that step toward me. From this text that we gather in order to be a disciple, Jesus demands that he become the most important thing in our life, our ultimate priority. He wants to be numero uno. This is what Luke is trying to remind us of when he recorded these words in chapter 14. So consider with me the rearrangement of our priorities if we're to count the cost properly to be a disciple, okay? The first thing is Jesus must be your priority. What does that look like? Jesus needs to be more important to you and more dear to you than anything or anyone. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. What? Jesus is saying here that, I mean, we know because the Bible in its whole, no, it has communicated well our responsibility to our family, right? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Children, honor, obey your parents. We're to honor our fathers and our mothers. We know that. The whole of Scripture counsels that. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, I need to be first priority. We know we need to honor our father and mother and to hold honor for Christ higher. We know we're needing to love our wives, love our husbands. We hold our love for Christ higher. We know we need to love our children. We need to hold our love for Christ higher. We need to obey and honor our parents. We need to hold our honor and obedience for Christ higher. The Lord needs to have the highest priority in our lives. And let me tell you, when He does, all those relationships will be just fine. Because He instructs us elsewhere how we're to live with our family. But no human relationship should be more intimate, no human bond more inseparable than that between the disciple and his master. Agreed? All right, second. Jesus must be valued above life itself. Wow. Jesus should be more valuable to us than our very own lives. Woo! That's a cost. Discipleship demands a devotion to the Lord Jesus that surpasses the instinct we have to preserve our own life. Here's a reality. According to Open Doors, or an international mission that... uh, uh, discloses, researches, assesses, and helps 
persecuted Christians? They say today, a hundred million Christians around the globe are currently suffering persecution for their faith. One hundred million Christians. Some are in prison, some are being abused, some are just dealing with ongoing hostilities. In some cases, though, Christians are asked to face more than scorn in prison or the loss of health. They have to face death, beheadings, awful stuff. And we Western Christians, mm, we, can't, we can't hardly comprehend that. But if we do, the history of the church and our current worldwide predicament reminds us there is a great price we need to be willing to pay. I hope it never happens that God could demand that kind of sacrifice on your life. Jesus also said if we're going to value him above life itself, we're going to love God more than money and possessions. That's what he was talking about in Luke 14. Therefore, no one can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Oh, wow. I've got to give it all up. Simply put... He needs to have priority over that. What that means to me is that every spending decision I make is a spiritual decision. But I need to let the Lord Jesus inform. Lord, would you have me get this frappuccino? Is that okay? You know, as I look at the scale and scope of my obligations as a husband, as a father, as a son, is it okay that I get that Java mocha chip? Or do I need to hold off on that, right? story of the rich young ruler illustrates this requirement. I mean, he wanted to be a disciple badly. And when Jesus said, sell all you've got and give to the poor, we know what happened to him. He just couldn't pay the cost of that. Paul instructed those who are rich in material things to be rich in good works in 1 Timothy 6. And not to trust in the uncertainty of riches because it's here today and gone tomorrow. I am blown away. I did the research on how many of these big Powerball winners have anything five years later. And it's like, it's less than 10% have anything after they've gotten millions of dollars. It just, it's like the wind. But here's the deal. Nothing must compete with our devotion to and our dependence upon the Lord for material things. Okay. The disciple of Jesus next must daily die to self-interest. Oh my goodness. I know what I want. I want that. I must die to my self-interest. That's hard. That's a cost. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Woo, i got to lay aside the things that I want to seek. My, um, my selfish ambition it means that our desire and our ambition are not to satisfy ourselves, but to please Jesus. He rather than self is the object of our supreme affection. Pleasing Him is the highest, most compelling motive of a disciple's life. Okay? Next. The disciple of Jesus makes proclaiming the kingdom an extremely high priority. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We're not to be hearers of the word but doers of all that God asks us to do, James 1.22. We're to invest our lives putting forth the awareness of the kingdom and teaching of Jesus at every opportunity. That's a cost. Because sometimes I lack courage. Sometimes I just don't feel good. Most of the time for me, I've destroyed my witness with somebody. And I need to go to them and humble myself and say, you know, I haven't done right with you. I admit that. The cost of discipleship. Making Jesus known. So here's a summary of all of that. Put all these elements together, we can conclude that true discipleship puts Jesus above everything and every th- everyone. We see his purposes, his desires is vastly more important than our own. It's one of the best analogies I've ever heard is when somebody signs up in lists in the armed forces, okay? You cannot sign up for the armed forces and be autonomous. We have military in here. Thank you. When you signed up, did they say, okay, you can, we just want you to be in shape. You can eat anytime you want. And we'd like you to figure out how to do a couple of things on your own, okay? Doesn't work like that. We, you're enlisted. Your interests become subservient to those you're in authority to. It's like, boy, I'd like that, but no, they said it. I got to do it. You're told when you get to eat, you get to leave when they say, it is granted. 
but you're contributing to a greater cause because you've made yourself expendable to that cause. And so it is with discipleship. So it is with following Jesus. But the point I want to make is that the sacrifices we make in this present life to give Jesus first place and proclaim His kingdom are to our benefit now, here and now, and in eternity. All right? So here's where the little card comes in. What I want to do is just ask you to think for a minute, just in the quietness of your own heart, about the next set of things I want to talk about. So how can we measure our discipleship, how we're doing? How am I doing as an individual, as a disciple? Now the beautiful thing about this is God's grace covers it all, okay? And if you look at this piece of paper and when we get to the bottom of it, you haven't checked anything, God's grace covers it all. He wants more for you. He wants better for you. But His grace is sufficient. Amen? All right. So what if we could just in our own private heart assessment, realistically give an accounting of how we're doing as a disciple? And then here's why I don't want you to put your name on these, because I want to take them up, okay? We want to take them up, and then we want to let, I want to look at what it's saying, what God is saying to the leadership of Heart's Journey as a result of this. Are there things that this church could be doing, the elders, the leaders here could be, Rick could be doing to help you be a better disciple, okay? Collectively, how could we be more healthy? Maybe there's an area or a specific area that you could just collectively say, we ought to do that and just begin to think and pray about it, okay? So, you know, it's relatively easy to measure church attendance. You're here, right? I mean, you're here. And, uh, you know, if you're involved in a group, a small group, um, your participation in that, that's easy to, how much you give. There's somebody in here knows how much you give. You know how much you give, and God knows how much you give. That's kind of easy. Um, but one thing that I've learned is that showing up for Sunday church, your activity in church doesn't necessarily mean you're a disciple. So there are six vital areas that I think point to a growing disciple. And that's what we all want to be. We want to be, we want to be creating treasure in heaven, don't we? Right? So on number one, I think on the little form, it says this. What did I do with mine? Well, I had it. There it is. Being disciples, you make a difference. Please check the areas where you sense you are doing well as a disciple. The first one is serving God's people. Now, let me explain that. Church attendance without service does not grow me as a disciple. To grow, I have to serve generously. I have to serve with my time, my talent, and my treasure, okay? 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Do you know what your gifts are? Your spiritual gifts. Do you know what they are and are you serving in those gifts? Because that's an area of service where you can tend to be energized, not drained. Know your gifts. Serve in those gifts. God created you with those gifts. He gave you those gifts to serve His people. John 15, 8, this, this is my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to be honest. And if you need like you're taking a test in school, you need to... Put the arm up because you don't want your neighbor to know. Just between you. Check if you are faithfully consisting, consistently giving of your time, talent, and treasure there. And if you're not, it's okay. God's grace. But we want to help you there. Number two, praying consistently. This is so obvious that it often just gets overlooked. Um, a growing disciple displays Jesus' pattern of consistent, heartfelt prayer. Luke 18.1 and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Are you anxious? Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. Are you praying regularly? If you're praying daily and not just at meals, Okay, those kind of don't count. I'm sorry. He blessed the food because it's in front of you, okay? But if you're praying daily, if you've got a time, I mean, you know, some people pray in the car. They shut off all the audio, and they just have a conversation with God. Some people in the mornings before they begin their day, when they hit their 
feet on the floor, they drop to the knee, and they spend time in prayer to God. Do you, if you are praying daily, more than just at meals, check right there, okay? And if you're not, we want to help you. And God's grace covers it. He loves you. He wants the best for you. Three, reading God's Word. Studies show that the biggest single factor in growing as a disciple of Jesus is reading the Bible every day. It is the fuel of discipleship, reading God's Word. We know Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. 1 Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, soaking, meditating in God's Word, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Are you reading God's Word? Are you doing it? I'll give you a, I'll give you a little slack. Almost daily. How's that? If you are regularly, almost daily, reading the Word of God, check there, okay? And the fourth way we can assess our discipleship is ask ourselves, are we engaging in biblical community together? Are we willing to be known and to to let others be known to us? Here's the truth. Discipleship throughout the Bible is always in the context of community. It's always with others involved. Now, being in a small group doesn't guarantee you'll be a disciple, but not being in biblical community will prevent you from being a disciple. We cannot do Jesus and me theology anymore. Jesus and me doesn't happen anymore. You can look at the growth of the church in the United States. We are anemic, and it's it's, the growth is surprisingly stalled, if not declining. Jesus and me is not what the gospel is. It's Jesus and us. And what we're saying is you need to be known in community. Now, does, does Heart's Journey do small group ministry? Do you have small groups? Okay. So you need to be involved with other people. You need to be known to other people. You know, in in our fellowship, what we're finding is that's where the care takes place. That's where sin is confessed. That's where people are loved well and people are accountable to each other. They're open. That's community. That's biblical community. Heart's Journey community. Awesome. So you need to be known. And that's probably going to be gathering at times other than your worship time. You need to be known. And here's the beauty of it. God intends you to be in community. When you're not there, everybody misses it. There's something that God has put in you that you're to bring to the table. And when you're not at the table, it's like when my kids aren't at my table at dinner and and I don't know where they are, I want my kids at the table. We need you at the table because God has instilled in you a gift for His people that only you have that when you're not there, we miss out. We miss out. It's your gift of mercy. It's your gift of prophecy. It's whatever your gift is that God has put in you as a believer. You need community. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. How do we do that? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day, capital D day, drawing near. And then, of course, Acts 2, the the, the the disciples in the first century church, they showed us. I mean, they were house to house, guys. They were house to house, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer together, to the breaking of bread together. And God was affirming it with signs and wonders, and many were coming to faith. So I want you to check if you are regularly part of a small group for accountability, care, Bible study, and prayer. If you are regularly involved in biblical community, I want you to check that box, okay? The fifth way we can assess our discipleship is being actively involved in outreach, being missional, okay? 
Biblical disciples engage to reach those outside the faith. They do it in your home. They do it at your workplace. You do it in your school. You do it in your community, your neighborhood, and in the world. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age, Jesus said. Then Acts 5, 42, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is Christ, that Christ is Jesus. And then Acts 1, 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses. You're the witnesses. You need to be involved in evangelism. You need to be speaking grace and truth and love to those outside the faith a lot, often. That's your calling as a disciple. And you can say, you know, I don't, I do not have the gift of prophecy. I just cannot, you know, you've heard of Bill Bright's four spiritual laws. You're like, I'm part of the four spiritual flaws. I can't do that, right? I can't, I don't know how to do that. I, I want to be better. I, I want to do better at that. I want to, I want to be able to share the gospel with people. Well, if you've got the gift of mercy, you know what you do to share the gospel with people? Is you be merciful. If you've got the gift of, of prophecy, you're the ones that, you're like the megaphone for us, right? You're part of that, that part of the body. But as a biblical community, you know what each of you are. You know what gifts God has instilled in each other. And you, you work together as a team of disciples. So, you're actively involved in a missional outreach. Check here if you're consistently involved in sharing and the gospel and expanding the kingdom of God. Just put a box there. If it doesn't have a mark, then the church needs to help. And God's grace covers it, okay? I don't want you to think I'm going legalistic on you here. God's grace covers it all. But God wants you to flourish, not only here, but in heaven. All right, and then six, this is the last assessment. Are you developing other disciples? Jesus' final command was, was very clear. The Great Commission was very clear. Go and make disciples, right? Teaching them. And then in John 15, he said, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And then Mark 1, 7, Jesus said to them, Follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. Are you developing disciples? There are people in your community, in your church, who need someone who's just like, I, I love this about being a discipler. You just got to be one step ahead. You know, I, when I first started teaching Sunday school, I, I felt like I really had to know the whole of Scripture, to, to, to teach a class on Timothy. It would have been helpful, right? I'm not knocking that. But all I needed to do, if I'm doing 1 Timothy chapter 1, I just need to make sure I, I have a grasp on that. As a discipler, what you can do is just be life on life with somebody. What, the way you live your life will teach as much as a Bible study. When they see you go through trial and trouble and pain and relationship crisis, when they see how you handle that with a biblical worldview, that speaks into their life, the gospel. So, you who've been walking the journey for a while, you men, you have a Timothy? Do you have a Timothy? And women, are you a Titus to woman? Are you helping women, younger women along? We're called to do that. We're called to develop other disciples. So if you're actively investing time and your biblical worldview into one or more people who are relatively new to the faith, and you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be that new. Check that box, okay? Now this is how we, if you notice the first letters in that, because this is what preachers do. First letters and all of that, what does it spell? If you look at it as an acrostic, spread. Isn't that what we're called to do? Spread the knowledge of God, the glory of God, and His Christ to the world. If we're disciples who've counted the cost and we're in, and we're excelling at these things, the gospel will spread. It will. It will spread. And I'm optimistic that the gospel will spread. So are you a disciple of Jesus Christ today? 
Having looked at the benefits and counted the cost, is he the most important person in your life? Let me tell you, if he's not, you're being cheated out of a life that would flourish. If you've considered the cost of discipleship and its rewards, what you're going to find is that discipleship is the only way. So may God grant you the grace, love, wisdom, discernment, and power to become a disciple that knows the benefits and also knows the cost. So God needs you to be a strong believer and follower of Jesus. Because God needs heart's journey to be full of strong Jesus followers. To bring glory to Him. Because these neighborhoods around this church need Jesus. They need you to show them the way. About 80 days ago, I got a phone call from a friend who told me that his son's best friend had just taken his life. He lived in, uh, the, the friend that called me was in Western Hills. And uh, I knew the family, so I came running to two houses down from this church on August the 16th, where a young man, 21 years old, had taken his life. And I thought about the importance of this church in that evening, the importance of having an influence for Christ in all these neighborhoods around here. And it falls to you because you're planted here. Now that family is doing incredibly well because God's grace has been more than sufficient. But I just want you to know that there are people around this church that need to know about Jesus. And they need your lives to model a follower of Him. So when you've done your little card, I want you to take it and I want you to fold it. If you have thoughts on the back, I want the feedback that you have. That would be incredibly helpful. And then you're going to share a meal together today. I am unfortunately going to have to roll because I've got commitments uh, this afternoon um, at Mosaic. Uh, so I regret that. I, I, I wish I could stay with you. But I'd like for you to leave those. I think we've got a basket. Did I hear a basket out there? It's right outside the door. Just drop those in there. Rick's going to get them. Again, don't put your name on them. What Rick's going to do is look at them, and the leaders of the church will say, how do we respond to this? God, what are you telling us? Okay? So let me pray for you. Father, we uh, are blown away today at the, just the way we kind of earthly view all these incredible gifts you've given to us that we call benefits of knowing you through your Son. Lord, we have looked today at at what the here and now benefits are, and we just thank you for them. And Lord, we are grateful today for the promise of an eternity in your presence, an eternity in a place that's indescribable with a life that will last forever, where there will be no pain, no fear, no problems. Thank you for that. And Lord, we have looked today at the costs of following you. And Father, we have said we know it's worth it. And we know there is a cost. And Lord, we're willing to pay the cost. And I pray that incrementally, Lord, just baby steps could be taken by each one of us to say, you know, I, I really am not doing your will in this area of my life. I, I, need, I need to step it up, Lord. And Lord, in that humility, would your spirit just come in and begin to blow on the coal and begin to fan that into a flame, Lord, that would burn really, really bright right here in this church. You are a good God. We thank you for your grace, for how you make us strong in our weaknesses. We give you amazing glory today for this body, for each one who claims the name of Christ. Use us today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.